Hi, I'm Mark Evadier. I'm the producer, writer, and voice director of most of the Garfield cartoon shows. You're watching In Conversation with Amber the Fangirl ATF. Hi, guys. Amber here, and welcome back to another episode of In Conversation with Amber the Fangirl ATF. Now, today, this is the first time I've not had a voice actor on this show. This time, I'm having a writer, producer, director, you name it, legend, Panel hoster, animation super, what's it called? Um, Supreme. That's it. That's that's the word. Yes, this man has worked on everything from the Garfield show to deck the halls with wacky walls, and he hosts, as I said, really amazing cartoon panels at San Diego Comic Con online. He did actually do an online panel with Corey Burton last year, and that was actually so good. My guest is none other than Mark Evania. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. You were actually talking about, I actually have been a voice actor for a line or two here and there. Oh, have you? Yes. Yes. Because I was the director and I hired me. Actually, I didn't hire, I didn't pay me, but I gave myself a line here or there once mm -hmm. in a while. And you can tell them because if you watch those shows, you go, who did that line? That's not a professional actor, but sometimes I sneak in for a bit. Mostly I write, write and direct. Yeah. Ah, I see. What was your first job doing rising directing? Was it in the 70s? Because I recall you saying about the 70s. Um, well, what happened was I did a, uh, you mentioned this thing called Deck the Halls with Wacky Walls. Uh, yeah. I wrote this special for, AB, uh, for NBC. I've even forgotten the year for it. And I was the 83. writer. 83. 83, thank you. And I wrote the thing. And uh, NBC was producing this directly. It was an outside studio doing the animation, but there was no cartoon studio attached. So they came to me and they said, uh, we need a voice director. And I'd been, I, by this point, I had worked for Hanna-Barbera and Ruby Spears and, and other studios a lot. Um, and I'd worked with some of the voice directors. And at that point in the business, there weren't very many good voice directors. That would change soon after. But the few good voice directors that existed we're only, we're all under exclusive contracts sometimes. Yeah. So uh, they showed me a list of the available voice directors and said, which one do you think should do the show? And I said, I can't do a worse job than any of these people. Why don't you let me do it? And they said, okay, fine. So I directed that show and I, I cast, uh, I had the dream cast. They let me pretty much cast it myself. So I had in the show, um, Dawes Butler, to my mind, the greatest voice actor who ever lived. Yeah, uh, alongside Mel Blanc. And, uh, well, Mel Blanc was wonderful too. But, but Dawes, yeah. personal, a personal thing, and I knew Dawes well, and it was just he was just a lovely, wonderful man. And I had uh, Frank Welker. You've heard of him. I had uh, Tress McNeil. I had Marvin Kaplan, Peter Cullen, Howard Morris. I had a, we had a kid actor, and I got Scott Menville, who Scott was about 11, 11 at the time or 10 years old, and a few other people like that. Bill Scott was in it. Yes. And I think they have been his first non J Ward cartoon voice job. And uh, it, it came out fine, and I directed after that. People would come to me and say, hey, well, since you're running this, why don't you voice direct it? And um, I directed, voice directed most of the Garfield and Friends shows and all of the Garfield shows and a few other things here and there. Usually I'm the writer and or producer. Well, I'm always the writer, occasionally the producer. And they may say, well, why don't you direct it? It saves us bringing somebody else in and getting them up to speed on what's, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's so cool, man. Like, so what was, what was the recording session for Deck the Halls, Wacky Balls like? Well, it was tense because I had the whole NBC executive board of the children's department behind me and they were oh. critiquing every line and saying, have him read that this way. Don't have him read it that way. And uh, it, it was tough. It was, I was inexperienced. I had watched other voice directors. I had actually kind of unofficially interned with Gordon Hunt at Hanna-Barbera. I went to some sessions. Gordon allowed me. They usually didn't let the writers into sessions at Hanna-Barbera. You handed them the script and then the next you saw that it was on the air. So I went to a couple of those sessions with, with Gordon's permission and kind of audited and took, you know, observed what he did. And I went to a few other people's sessions and I was kind of protected because, you know, with the cast I had, you couldn't do a bad job with those people. And at one point, our friend Frank Welker helped me out a lot. Uh, I was under, he could tell, because he's done this a lot, 
that I was under siege from the network for criticizing things and asking to do things over. They just, you know, they, they were all nice people, but you had, there were too many of them. You know, it's sometimes it's much easier to work for one idiot than it is for five nice people. Yeah. So Frank at one point said to me, Mark, I got a question about this line. I don't understand. I do it. Could I speak to you in private for a second? And I went, oh, sure. So I called five, five minute break for everybody else. And I went into the booth and Frank took me aside and he had no question about the script. He just said, listen, you need to do this. And he gave me advice on what I was doing wrong. He said, you got to go back and pick this up. And tell Dawes to use this for that and you know, whatever it was. And he, he saved, he wasn't the only person who saved me. Dawes saved me by being wonderful. Bill Scott saved me by being wonderful. Frank gave me this personal help because he was so smart having done more sessions than anybody else in that room, probably. And, and he knew exactly what to, how to, what I had done wrong. And, and uh, uh, we got through that and the show came out okay. Was the special recorded at night? Because I remember having an exchange with Scott and he said something about it being at night. I don't think so. No, it wasn't at night. No, it oh. was uh, during the day. It was a very hot day. I remember he was coming in sweating and, <laughs> and exhausted. But we were out in the valley someplace. Mm. And, and I sent a limo for Dawes. Oh, wow. So, Dawes Butler, I paid for a limousine to bring him. Uh, so I didn't want him, him you know, taking the bus or whatever. He's royalty, of course. Yeah, I missed that a lot of fun, honestly. That, I would have killed to have done something like that. I mean, with, with a dream cast of Tress, Peter, Frank, Dawes, Bill. Amazing. Well, I mean, well you know, on the Garfield and Friends show and on the Garfield show, I had pretty much full casting power. And so I got to bring in almost anybody I wanted. And I, I am obsessed with a movie you probably have heard of called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Mm-hmm. I love that film. It changed my life when I saw it in 1963. And I'm on the commentary track of the Criterion DVD Blu-ray. You know, oh, wow. Hear that? Yeah, I'm one of the people on the commentary track. And so I brought in Jonathan Winters to be in an episode. I brought in Marvin Kaplan to be in an episode. I brought in Don Knotts to be in an episode. These are people who, I had, uh, who were in that movie and I just wanted to work with them. Jonathan Winters actually at Hanna-Barbera when I had an officer, Jonathan Winters would be recording smirks. And when the session let out, he'd come into my office because there was usually a gathering there of writers. We were in there plotting against management. Mm-hmm. And he would just start, he would walk in the door and I would turn to Jonathan Winters and say, so are you here to fix the plumbing? And he would instantly become a plumber and he'd start talking to me like a plumber. And we'd do 12 minutes of me interviewing Jonathan Winters as a plumber. Wow. Was, I wanted to, I just wanted to have him on a show of mine. I wanted you know, some of these people on them. And, and, and I got to work with a lot of people whose work I loved. I mean, you know, Amber, if tomorrow you had a chance to voice direct a cartoon show, you know a dozen people you'd love to have in those sessions. Oh, so yeah. I, I, I could think of all these people I wanted to work with, a few of whom had not worked in cartoons for a long time. I brought in a lot of guys who just hadn't done cartoons for a while. Uh, I brought in an actor I love named Shepard Bankshaw who was the voice of Clyde Crashcup on the old Alvin and the Chipmunks show. Oh, wow. and he had a lot of other things. And he hadn't done cartoons for like 10 or 15 years. And he came in, he was surprised anybody asked for him. And he said, what do you want me to do? I said, can you sound just like the guy who did Clyde Crashcup on the Alvin and the Chipmunks show? And he said, well, I was the guy who did Clyde. Yes, I know that. That's why I did. And he came in and did that voice. And uh, other people like that, it was just neat to work with them. It was, a, it was they were all appropriate for the cartoons we were doing. They were, they were not cast just because they were somebody I always wanted to work with. But when I found an opportunity, I would, well, sometimes I'd write a show for them. I just wanted to work with these people, so I'd write a show for them. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, I would, I would honestly, like, you sound like you have probably have the best career, like, voice directing people and getting to hang out with all these people for, like, days on end and stuff like that. Like, how, how, how do you not, I'm not saying, obviously, it's boring or anything. How do you not get tired of it? Is it, is it, is it in, like, interesting because a new thing happens every day? Well, you know, it's like, there are people ask me, and they say, what do you do? I'm a writer. Well, how do you get cope with just sitting at the typewriter or the computer all day writing? Well, that's what I've chosen to do. It's the life we choose for ourselves. As they say in the mafia, this is the life we've chosen. And I like writing and I like seeing the show work come to fruition. And it was so much fun to write on the Garfield shows 
because everything I wrote was going to be recorded. I wasn't have, I didn't, I hadn't, there was no approval process. I wrote a script, we recorded it. I actually would sometimes book the actors before I wrote the scripts. Um, I would book the actor, we were recording on Monday and Tuesday. So on Friday, I would say, okay, I'm gonna need you know this person, this person, this person, because I knew kind of what I was gonna write. And then yeah. over the week, I would write the scripts and we duplicate them Monday morning early and the actors would get them when they, when they walked in the door. One time on a Saturday, I'm sitting right in this chair writing a Garfield script and I realized, oh, the, the story had changed. The story I wanted to write had changed and I needed, needed more female actors. I had two actresses come in, I needed an extra one. So I went on Facebook uh, just, and I happened to notice Lorraine Newman was online, who I'd worked with and was a friend of, and I just called her into chat and I said, what are you doing Monday? And she said, uh, 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 I had nothing booked. I said, okay, I'm booking you for Monday. <laughs> I booked her on Facebook, literally. And she was worried she'd have to give Facebook 10% of the, the fee. But, um, you know, and I'd run into actors. And play. One day I was, uh, I lived near a place called Farmer's Market in LA. It's like a tourist thing. It's just full of places to walk around and eat. And I ran to Lenny Weinrub there one day. And Lenny said, hey, when are you going to have me on the Garfield show? And I said, how about next Monday? And he said, fine. <laughs> And I went home and wrote a script that for thinking, you know, now here's, I know all these great characters Lenny does. Let me pick a voice and, and, and write a character around it. Um, and then, you know, you, you just, it's, it's exciting. And the voice sessions are fun because most voice people uh, are very lovely and fun to get around with. If, if you look at the voice panels I've done online, a recurring theme is what big fans, all these people are of each other. They are not competitors. They all work together off and on. Eventually everybody works with everybody else and everybody respects the fact that somebody else can do something they can't. Uh, you'll, you'll see two guys who are just mutual admiration society because one guy is saying, God, I love that British accent you do. And this guy is saying, oh, I love that, that monkey sound you make. And, and they're both right. So it's very nice. You know, I, I, in, I live in Hollywood. I've been a writer since I was 17. I go around, I meet lots of out of work actors. I work with lots of people who are bitter because they're not working, they're unhappy because nobody's hired them. They're uh, miserable because their TV series was canceled and they can't get another one. It's so nice to be in a room full of people who are all working and be happy they're working and enjoying each other's company. Um, I have yet to direct a vo cartoon voice session in the era of the pandemic where people are at their own home studios. I'm going to be doing that probably later this year. And it, I don't know if it'll be as much fun, but we do the panels, we get them all online. And, you know, even if you see the hour long panel I did, you don't see the 15, 20 minutes beforehand, we were all online talking and the hour we spent afterwards online chatting. After that, what I did with Maurice LaMarche, Mo and I stayed online for like an hour and a half, just, you know, doing a video chat ourselves, talking about mutual acquaintances and stories lovely man, brilliantly talented, uh, and he's doing something he is A, good at, and B, loves to do. And, and that's a recipe for happiness in this world. If you people are paying you to do something you love and something you're good at, and you don't feel competitive, you don't feel like, how come this guy got five jobs last week and I only got three? If you can get that out of your head, then <laughs> it's a very lovely existence. And a lot of people, as you know, who could have had or did have on-camera careers prefer the voiceover world because it takes an awful lot of ego out of it. It takes an awful lot of worrying about competitiveness. You, you, you know, uh, a lot of these people just don't like the auditions when you come in and eight people stare at you and look at your appearance and look at your, your, you know, do you have bags under your eyes? Are you getting older? Are you, you know, are you putting on a couple of pounds? Voice actors don't worry about that. You know, and now in the era of directing people on Zoom, the voice actors don't even have to have pants on. They could be they could be naked from the waist down. Their appearances don't matter. All that matters is what they put them into the microphone. Exactly. And speaking of uh, Maurice LaMarche, um, I've been trying to get an interview with him as well. And like people like Brad Paulson and everyone like that. I'm friends with Maurice on Facebook and I've tried messaging him, but he hasn't seen my messages. And okay. I've tried... You know, it's real simple. After we, that we do this, you just drop Maurice a simple email that says, hi, I just recorded a wonderful session with Mark Evanier and he thought you'd be great on my podcast. Let me know when you have time, to, if you have time to do it. And leave it at that and eventually you'll hear from Sweet, I'll go at that. 
A yeah, lovely man, just just very brilliant and funny. He was on the very first voice panel I did in San Diego. Oh, wow. And the very first one I ever did there, the first time anybody brought voice actors down to a comic convention, to my knowledge, and had them demonstrate what they did, was I put together a panel and I had Greg Berger, Joe Alasky, Rob Paulson, and Maurice LaMarche. Wow. Um, the audience just loved it. We, we filled the room and turned away a thousand people who couldn't get seats. And the panels just got larger and larger after that. So now they give me the biggest room they have at San Diego, which is 3,200 people on Saturdays. And we fill it up and turn away a thousand people. Wow. Um, so are you planning on, who, who, who have you got planned for your next panel, whether it be online or at San Diego? Well, I'm doing an online panel next week, which will have aired by the time you put this thing up here, I think. Yeah. So, uh, and I actually only, I only have two people set for it of the four I'm going to have. I'm waiting for the other two to call me back. It's, you, you know, the, the disadvantage of doing these online panels is that all of a sudden somebody gets called for work at the last yeah. minute. We, we need you Monday from, you know, one to eight, you know, whatever. So we have to book the use. He's kind of at the last minute. So I can't tell you for sure who the other people are going to be. And the, and the two I have may all of a sudden get jobs. But I'll have, I'll have four people to do it. I have, I have a lot of people who, who've done the panels, who want to do them again. Uh, in fact, I had a couple of them kind of call me every time they know I'm doing a panel. Can I be on this one? No, no, I've got to get somebody else. I got to vary it. I don't want to ask you the same questions or have you do the same voices. Uh, and then also I have good relationship with some of the local agents and, and uh, they will call me and say, Hey, uh, I've got these people you should know about for your casting needs. I'm not casting anything right at the moment, but also, you know, they would love to do your panel. They all would love to do your panels because, you know, people have gotten work off my panels, literally, um, I think it was Candy Milo once was on one of the first time she was on a panel. She was so funny that when she came off the panel, as she walked down the stairs, there was a person from an ad agency there and said, could you please have, give me, here's my business card. Could you please have your agent call me on Monday? I'd like to book you for a commercial. Wow. And I've had a couple of people on the panel. Um, uh, I better not tell you who they were, but, but, you know, they had a guy on the panel one time and he was so brilliant and funny, the new guy in the business, relatively new guy in the business, but I, I thought he was worth putting on the panel. And one of the top agents in the, in, the, in the business was sitting in the third row next to his assistant. And he turned to the, the assistant and said, get, client, get. And they signed him up right after the panel. He got, wow. a, he got a great agent right through that. That's not why people do it. They do it because they're proud of what they do. They do it because they love the fact that people you know, it's like if you have, if you had a skill, I, I'm also, I also friends with lots of magicians and magicians always want to show off what they can do. They always want to say, you know, here, pick a card. Look, look what I've learned. Look, look at the new skill I've just learned. And voice actors are like that. And cartoonists who I work with are like that. They're proud of what they do. They don't want to be exploited. They don't want to do a lot of this for free when they should be for jobs, which they should be paid, yeah. but, but they're proud of what they do. And they like the delight. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, but I have seen some of the top voice actors in the world meet children and they start doing the voices for them. And the kids are just start squealing with delight. Uh, I, on other panels, I've told my story of directing Mel Blanc and, and, and there were people who came into the session who were just so excited to meet. They could not have met a more exciting celebrity than Bugs Bunny. And Mel Blanc was delighted to sign autographs for them and do bugs for them and such. Um, because voice people are very nice and they're very, there's about you know, 2% of the voice acting business is, is people you don't want to work with. They're bad people, they're, they're selfish people, they're, and they don't, and those people don't make it. Those people are always struggling for work, which makes them, you know, pissier and nastier usually. Yeah. Back to Garfield. Uh, I know this is completely off topic, but me and my friend were watching the uh, live action Garfield films recently. Did you have any involvement in them? I never even saw them. Oh, no, did you not? I never, never saw them, never had anything to do with them, no. What about the the CGI one that was like, Garfield gets real the first time? No, I, was, I, was, I was away from Garfield. We did the Garfield and Friends show. Mm -hmm. I went off and did a few other things. You, you should understand here, 
that the reason I was writing all the Garfield and Friends shows was that Jim Davis didn't have time to. Jim Davis does the Garfield newspaper strip. He was the master of Garfield. He since sold the character, but at this point he, he owned Garfield. He had a company that did Garfield. He had a huge place in Muncie, Indiana with a staff of like 40 people in the Garfield business handling Garfield merchandise and Garfield licensing and Garfield toys and Garfield clothing. And of course the newspaper strip. And Jim had written the prime time animated Garfield specials. And when CBS came to him and said, we really want a Garfield show for Saturday morning. He said, I don't have time to write it. I can't do, I just can't squeeze that in. I, and, and, I, and I don't trust any other writers. And CBS said, if we could find a writer you would trust, would you let us do it? And he said, sure. And I was the writer that he trusted, which is the reason I wrote or co-wrote all of them. Uh. That was the I had other writers angry at me saying, can't you give me some assignments on Garfield? I said, no, you're asking me to give you my job. My job was not to be story editor of the show. It was to write the shows. And I had my then lady friend help me with a few of them. But um, we, uh, you know, they were, I, we did 121 and a half hours and I wrote or co-wrote 121 of them. Uh, and Jim trusted me to do that. Then that, when that show, and I went on to other things. And then when they did the CGI specials, they were, <laughs> Few, they only did a couple of them and they were long deadlines. So Jim had time to write those with his local people. And then when the new Garfield show came down, the, the CGI one that was animated in the French studio, Jim did not have time to write that. So I became the, the supervising producer writer of that show. Um, and now there's other, Jim is not as involved with Garfield as, as he was. And so I'm not doing Garfield now. I, whether I will again or not is an open question. I think it's Nickelodeon who's doing a new Garfield show for this year or next, I've heard. Um, I think it's been released in France, but not in any English-speaking countries yet. I, I don't think anything's been done. Not much has been done. They're working on a Garfield feature now. I mean, oh, are they? Like, yeah. I don't know. You know, this I'm not in that business at the moment. I yeah. have other projects I'm writing. After we finish this interview, I'm doing an interview, not an interview, but a, a Zoom call to discuss another cartoon series we're working on which may or may not go into production soon. Ooh, uh, that's exciting. Uh, well, you know, you always have something going on. I mean, some of them fall through, some of them don't. You know, in this business, if you have five or six projects pending, you hope one of them will happen at the right moment. You hope, sometimes hope all of them don't. Uh, so uh, I do other things besides Garfield. I do other things besides uh, uh, TV cartoons and such. I write comic books. I write other things. I write, yeah. I'm running a live action movie at the, at the moment for someone. Things like that. You know, it, 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 I tell people who want to write comic books or cartoons, don't be a comic book writer. Don't be a cartoon writer. Be a writer who writes comic books or who writes cartoons, among other things. And and that's a much nicer. And, and you, this is the answer to your question earlier of you know, doesn't it get tiresome? No, because I write so many different things. I might write three different things today. Whether they're any good or not is, in, is, is immaterial almost at this point. But I, I will write something very serious later today, maybe, or something very silly. I was going to say, oh, you must I get like that. inspiration for new material and stuff. I, I just hope the serious thing is not silly and the silly, is, silly thing is not serious. That's all right. You get inspiration every place. And sometimes you get an idea that doesn't work as a cartoon, but it does work as a novel. Or you get yeah, it doesn't work as a, an animation, but does work live. So you you just be open to everything, and and writing one thing makes you a little better at the other sometimes because you can bring skills. What you learn, I wrote a lot of situation comedies for a while early in my career, and some of what I learned doing that uh, helped me writing cartoons, and some of what I learned writing cartoons helped me writing situation comedies and variety shows. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Have you ever thought about becoming a voice actor, like ever in, in your whole yeah, career? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, you see, here's the problem. Uh, I know uh, 350 people who are better at it than I am. <laughs> I mean, you know, I used to draw a little bit. I used to draw when I was much younger, because when you're a kid, you know, you have an idea, you want to turn into a comic book, you have to draw it yourself. So I drew. And then one day I was suddenly working with Jack Kirby and I'm working with the best artist in the business. And I became friends with a man named Sergio Aragonis, who was one of the best guys in the business. And I have friend, my friend Scott Shaw, who was one of the best artists in the business. And it's like, why am I bothering? You know, 
I, there's no way I'm, there's no time to gathering of comic book people where I'm going to be the best artist in the room. So I might be able to compete as a writer. I'm, I'm better at that. So you do what you do best. And it's the same thing. I, I stopped doing magic a lot because I, the more I was around great skilled magicians, the more I was around people who were practicing 60, 80 hours a week, which I didn't do because I was writing stuff. So yeah. you, know, you go with your strengths in this world. At least that's what was, was my idea. I have done a few voices here and there. And, uh, uh, and, I'm, and when I do it, I'm always conscious of the fact that everyone in the room is more qualified to do that line than I. So, so it's not, it's not, I don't do it. I don't do accents. I have enough trouble sounding like myself. Oh, bless you. Yeah. Well, wow. That I, I'm still, I'm still starstruck because like you have such a big career and like, I've always wanted to, you know, have a career like that. So that's really well, just some... Amber, you're, Amber, you're 17. Okay. I, when I was 17, I did not have this career. When you get to be well, not in my age, when you get to be 25, you will have a career that you only dreamed of at 17. And when yeah. you get to 35, you may have a career even better than when you were 25 or whatever it is. You're just starting out at whatever you do. And you've got a lot of energy and a lot of talent and you will apply that hopefully in the right ways. And it will lead you, and sometimes it will lead you to dead ends and sometimes it'll lead you to the wrong place. But if you stay in the game, eventually, you know, you'll, 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 find something that works for you. It may not be what you expect at this age. You may you know, discover 10 years from now there's something else you want to do more. Yeah, maybe. It's just, I feel, it feels, I feel as if I was born in the wrong era because I feel as if like 20 years from now when I'm like 37 or something like that and I've you know, gotten started in the industry, all the good people have gone by then, like all these new voice actors, they just, they don't have the same magic as the ones that we have today, to be fair. Well, they don't have the same relevance to your childhood maybe. Yeah, yeah. When I grew up, I see I was at the right time for the voice acting business because I got in early enough to work with Mel Blanc and Dawes Butler and June Ferre and Bill Scott and Don Messick and other people whose work I remembered watching when I was eight. I literally was conscious of who Dawes Butler was when I was eight. And one day I'm sitting having dinner with Dawes Butler and that voice is coming from the human being across the table from me. And Dawes turned out to be one of the sweetest, nicest men you could ever want to meet. I feel sorry for you. You never got to meet Dawes Butler. He was one of your favorite human beings in the world. 25, 30 you know? years too late. Anyway, yeah. But, but I was also around long enough, at late enough, to meet the next generation and the one after it. And yeah. now I work with people younger than me sometimes, voice actors who got in because they were inspired by you know, Dawes and Mel and June. And then later they were inspired by Frank Welker and, and people of his generation. And then they were inspired by other people. On the Garfield show, one of the wonderful things we did was I had an amalgam of those people. I had new people and I had old people. I had, you know, in, in the, uh, one of the last, Gar the last episode of the Garfield show we recorded, Stan Freeberg was in the show. Stan Freeberg, whose career started in the 40s. In, in, who did Mel, cartoons opposite Mel Blanc for Warner Brothers in the mid 1940s was in my cartoon show in the 21st century uh, doing voices. In fact, he was doing one of the same voices practically. And there's Stan Freeberg, a hero of mine, a person whose records I loved when I was nine years old and bought religiously. And that was wonderful for me. And I got to know June Ferre very closely. You know, uh, and, and be with you. I helped write her autobiography and, and such. And that was a very meaningful thing to me. And I knew Bill Scott. I knew some of these people outside of, you know, sessions and, and socialized with them. Um, and it was wonderful. To, but it but was great was the amalgam because on a Garfield session we might have, you know, uh, on the on say the on the new Garfield show we had Wally Winger here. We had Greg Berger here. We had Frank Welker there. We had Jason Marsden there. We had Audrey Wasilewski here. And then we might over here have Chuck McCann, or we might have Freeberg, or we might have June, or we might have Marvin Kaplan and, and these guys, these people. And the older people were energized by the younger people. And the younger people were energized by the older people. Yeah. It was a wonderful synthesis. And they all worked together and they all admired each other and they all envied each other. And it was just a, a very lovely experience. 
on a Garfield Friends show, I worked a lot with one of my favorite people, my favorite voice actors, Howard Morris, who I had grown up uh, loving. Just, just I met Howard Morris when I was like 12. I was on the set of the Andy Griffith show. And he had played the character Ernest T. Bass on the show, but he was visiting the set that day, not in character. And I was introduced to him. And I said, you're Adam Ant. He went, you know, like, you know that? Yes. He was, he, was, he was the voice of Adam Ant. He was the voice of Jughead and later on the Archie cartoons. He was the voice of a lot of the characters in the McDonald's commercials. He was the voice of Jet Screamer yeah. on the Jetsons. He was the voice of, of other Hanna-Barbera characters. And I knew who he was. And then years later, we became close friends and I directed him on shows. And uh, just a lovely man and a brilliant actor. You could ask Howie Morris to do a line eight times. He would do it eight completely different ways each time. And you couldn't pick which one was mm -hmm. the best. You wanted to sit there and say, do it a ninth time. Do it a tenth time. Let's see what happens. Because things would come out of him. He was the yeah. most improvisational, natural actor I ever met in my life. Uh, and I loved him dearly. And, and it was so pleasant to know him as a person. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it's... I, and, and this is true of an awful lot of the great voice actors. It was just wonderful to be around them, uh, and, you know, to know Bill Scott and to know June. And, you know, people forgot how, well, how, how good June was. In her, in her early 90s, June was still doing voices. And, uh, and, and, and she was as good as anybody could have hired. There was, it was particularly, I mean, obviously, if you had an old character, an old witch or something like that, there was nobody better. But even on young voices that, that I could have hired Tress McNeil for, I could have hired Gray Griffin for, I could have hired Julie Nathan for, June was perfect. The, you know, a lot of these people are almost interchangeable at times. But there was nothing wrong with hiring the 92-year-old woman for that part. And she showed up on time. June was the most prompt actress in the business. If you gave her a call time of 9 o'clock, she was there at 8. And she wow. took direction and she was professional and, and just... Wonderful. I, we did a memorial service for her at the uh, uh, Motion Picture Academy that uh, was produced by a bunch of us. Bob Bergen was one of the other producers and, and uh, uh, Howard Green and Jerry Beck and uh, Tom Cito. And, you know, I got up there to speak about June in front of the whole industry, practically. And I talked about how uh, she was on time for every single session in her life and never disappointed anybody. And there's a person whose career started in the golden days of radio, like on things like the Jack Benny show, and lasted long enough to be in video games. It was like every year technology was inventing a new way to give June Foray a job. And she spanned all that history uh, and, and, and did television. It's just some on-camera stuff, even on television and such. But... Um, this mammoth career that lasted about 75 years. Um, it, it's astounding how much, and, and, and she was good up until the last, only the last year or so did she start having some problems. That's, I, whatever you do with your life, Amber, it's, and whatever I do with the rest of my life, I don't think we'll be at a peak performances when we're 95 years old. <laughs> I, have, I have a feeling, whatever I do, I may not be doing my best work then. But uh, it's great that that, that that happens. And it's great to look forward to that. Uh, what else is there to talk about? What do you want to talk about? That's why I always ask the guests. Whatever, whatever you want to talk about. You want to name a voice person and I'll tell you stories about working with them? Okay, uh, well, you know. Oh, you know what I'm going to say. I know who Bill. you're going to say. Well, who? Bill. No, Scott. Bill Scott. Bill Scott, lovely man. Um, I helped cast him in a show called The Wuzzles, which I, which I developed. But uh, before that, he was on that Wacky Wall special I mentioned. Earlier. I, I had met Bill at animation festivals. We got along great. And for a while there, Bill was telling everybody, uh, actually, he was telling Jay Ward. Um, he, he said this in my presence more than once to Jay. He said, Jay, if anything ever happens to me, you let Evan here write all the scripts and you let Welker do all the voices. And wow. ultimately, there were other people involved. And, and you know, Keith Scott now does most of the Bullwinkle stuff and he's wonderful at it. But at one point we were that close and repeatedly I was asked to write uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle revival specials to be involved with them. 
And so I, and they, the deals kept falling through because the legal situation of who owned Rocky and Boyd at that time was very complicated with competing parties. And literally at one point, one company hired me, said, we've got the rights to Rocky and Boyd call. We want you to write this primetime special, bringing the characters back. And I said, fine. And the next day, another company called me and said, we've got the rights to Rocky and Boyle. And we want you to write this. And I went, fine. And I said, well, I have a feeling neither of these is going to happen. And neither of them happened because these two parties were fighting. But wow. Bill was a, a gentleman. He was funny. He was one of the very few voice actors who was as qualified to, excuse me, one of the very few writers and producers and artists in animation who is as qualified to do voices as the people you could hire. Most are not. There's a lot of bad voice work that turns up in cartoons because some guy who's, who's drawing or writing says, oh, I'll do that voice. And yeah, you were going to turn down, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, Frank Welker or Maurice LaMarche and Rob Paulson to get you. Maybe not. But Bill was as good as anybody who ever did that. Um, people don't realize somehow that the rock, the classic Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons were Bill Conrad, Paul Fries, Bill Scott, June Ferre, and nobody else. No matter what voice came along, they didn't bring in a guest star. One of those four people could do it, whatever it was. And actually, when you think about it, if you had Paul Fries and June Ferre in the room, why do you need anybody else? But they did these shows and they were just delightful. That's one of the reasons I became a fan of voice actors, because I grew up on Rocky and Bullwinkle and on the early Jay Ward's, uh, the early Hanna-Barbera stuff. And, um, so Bill and I got involved in a project with Frank Welker. We were going to do a Dudley do Right live action movie. We we're going to write it. We sold it to MGM. And then the legal situation kind of killed us. We had a few writing meetings here at my house. And then different competing forces that wanted to, uh, to do. This is way before anybody was doing live action movies or cartoon shows, which became a fad for a while. And we were starting to get the problem solved. And then Bill passed away which was quite of a shock for us. He was, it's out of nowhere. All of a sudden, uh, Frank called me and said, Bill just died. And we were both in, sho we were both in shock. Frank, Frank had no voice that night at all. Frank Welker, who could not find a single voice to say that in of all the, the thousand he has. And, uh, and, that, and the project fell apart without him. And, and it probably would have fallen apart with him because at that point, the, the, Tiffany Ward, Jay's daughter, eventually did an amazing job straightening all that out so now Rocky and Bullwinkle is not you know there are people fighting over the way they used to be but, but uh, for a long time there was no Rocky and Bullwinkle being produced because of all, all these legal complications and, ah. and sorry, I'm sorry Bill did not get to to uh, see that and participate in it but he got to do the Wuzzles and then because he was cast on the Wuzzles they cast him on the Gummy Bears show also Disney just loved him and then when he passed away Corey Burton inherited, uh, I think, the role in Dummy Bears, and we were finished with the Wuzzles by then. But, uh, you know, there's a guy who could just do just about anything. Uh, and uh, we, we, I talked earlier about the um, uh, Wacky Wall Walkers uh, session I directed, my first directing job. And like I said, I was under siege during that. And one of the things that you have to do if you're a voice director is keep the mood in the studio good. The cast has to be happy. The cast has to be entertained. And, and there are times in a session I'll just stop what we're doing and go in and chat with the cast for a while and tell them jokes and things to, to give them a break and to get their brains. The, the environment in which the work is done is very important. And there are voice directors who failed miserably in that because they were tyrants or they were too nasty or, or difficult to work with and people just fell on the defensive. Nobody's that good when they're on the defensive. So Bill in that session started telling, he, he knew, we had these delays and all of a sudden there's eight minutes when I'm arguing with the network and nothing's being recorded and Bill would fill in. He would start telling stories and jokes, doing bits to, for the, to keep the whole cast uh, up and, and energetic and laughing. Lovely guy. God rest his soul. Speaking of Mr. Welker, have you got a funny story about Frank? Uh, I've got lots of funny stories about Frank. I actually, um, one time I was talking to Frank and he did, uh, he, Frank does impressions of, that you never heard because there are people you don't know. And he was doing for me on the phone his impression of Lou Scheimer, who was the head of Filmation Studios. 
And I laughed. I'd seen Will uh, Lou Scheimer. I knew it was a good impression. I'd never worked for Filmation. About four weeks later, I get a call from Lou Scheimer. I thought it was Frank Welker. Lou Scheimer is saying to me, Mark, I want you to work on this show. It sounded just like the impression. And I agreed to work on a show for him before I realized it was Lou Scheimer and not Frank Welker. What show was that? Uh, it was a pilot I took my name off. <laughs> but, uh. Uh, but, uh, but Frank is just, you know, he's, uh, uh, the, the story, I told this story many times, and I think I told it on one of my podcasts, but we once had Frank Book to do Robin Leach on a Garfield show, and we ended up getting Robin Leach at the last minute. So when Frank walks in, we had to say, Frank, you're not going to do the Robin Leach for us. You're doing other voices. Um, we found someone who does a better Robin Leach than you, Frank Wendell. Really? Someone does a better Robin Leach than me? And we played him the track, and he for like 10 seconds, he thought, oh, my God, that guy does a better Robin Leach than me, until he realized he <laughs> was the real guy. <laughs> uh, but we had, uh, you know, we get Frank in to do, one time we had, uh, we had Gary Owens uh, in a session, and uh, for some reason, I don't remember why, we start, everybody started doing their Gary Owens impressions. So we decided to have, because we had a little time to kill, uh, we decided to have a Gary Owens sound-alike contest. And we got a person who was in the next session over to come over and judge it. And so we had Greg Berger do his Gary Owens impression, Neil Ross do his Gary Owens impression, Frank Welker do his Gary Owens impression, and Gary Owens do his, do the line. And the person we had come in thought that Frank was the real Gary Owens. <laughs> Frank, Gary came in second. Uh, so, um, you know, and things like that. Um, Frank used to do stand-up, and he, I, one of the times I went out and saw him do stand-up, he was at the Ice House, which is a club in Pasadena. It's a comedy club that gave a lot of people their start. You've probably heard of the Comedy Store. The Ice House was the Comedy Store before the Comedy Store was the Comedy Store. And Frank performed there a lot. And he was um, the headliner there, and the opening act was a friend of mine, a writer I knew who had turned, had started given up writing for stand-up comedy, it was a guy named Gary Shandling, who became a very big successful comic. He started by as Frank Welker's opening act. So at one point, there was a, like a girl singer on between the two of them. And I was in the, in the, up to the lobby to use the restroom and Frank was out there waiting to go on. And they had this whole wall full of eight by tens of great performers who had played the Ice House. And Frank was looking at the wall and he went down the wall and he just pointed at all these photos and he did the voices of everybody on the wall. He did the wow. Smoky Brothers, he did Pat Paulson. These are impressions he never did in public. They were wow. probably, in many cases, they were probably not impressions he never practiced. Wow. It was just, oh, there's Pat Paulson. He sounds like this. There's this person. He sounds like this. And he just went down the wall and I was like standing there with my jaw open like the audience of Springtime for Hitler. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And he just, just, it just poured out of him. It was amazing. And then subsequently at another gig, Frank was uh, on stage. This is at uh, Igby's Comedy Cabaret, which is no longer there. And Frank in his act would ask the audience for suggestions of impressions. You know, Who do you want to hear me do? And I started calling out really, really obscure people he'd never done before just to see if I could stump him. And I couldn't stump him. I just, I remember I called out John Houston. I don't know if you know who John Houston was, but it, it's a very obscure, he was a director and a character actor. And Frank <laughs> did John Houston perfectly. And I just, I give up. I can't name anybody he can't do. Wow. <laughs> yeah, very talented man and uh, very nice. Uh, we had uh, uh, the very first time I ever a cartoon show, it was an ABC weekend special called The Incredible Detectives. And I, it was the first cartoon show I ever wrote. And Frank was in the cast. In fact, I think I asked to have him in it. And I went to the session. And, I either, and that's either where Frank and I met or we met one time before that. I, it was two different times we were together. And I can't remember which one. But we exchanged phone numbers at one of those two times. And I listened to this. First time I'd heard a script of mine read by voice actors. I was not directing, obviously. And I thought the voice director was bad. I, or I didn't think he was bad. I just felt I didn't understand this. Frank would do the read a line. And I thought in my head, that's exactly the way I heard. It. He understood that line and he got it perfect. And then the voice director would say, no, no, Frank, do it like this. And the voice, this voice director wanted to be an actor. He was voice directing because he couldn't get enough acting work. 
In fact, he'd write himself into the show. He'd cast himself in bit parts, but he couldn't do the leads. He couldn't be a major voice actor on his own. And he would do the line his way and Frank would imitate him. We call that a line reading. And, and I thought it was wrong. But I thought, hey, I'm new at this. This is my first session. Obviously, there's a dynamic here I don't understand. I don't understand why the version that sounded wrong to me was right and the version that sounded right to me was wrong. So that evening, I worked up my courage and I called Frank at home. I said, thank you for today. But I got to ask you something. It sounded to me like every time you did a line and he corrected you, you were right and he was wrong. And Frank, with no malice or anger or anything in his voice, said, yeah, that's the way this director is. We're, we're right and he's wrong. Um, and that's just who he was. And, and that's one of the people I stopped directing, who didn't direct the wacky walls thing because I didn't want him. Yeah, of course. Wow, what a lovely story. Yeah, Frank is just real good. I mean, you know, and, and I don't want to make it sound like he's unique. I mean, I could tell you wonderful stories about Greg Berger and Wally Wingard and Lorenzo Music and, and all these people I've been fortunate to work with, Rob Paulson, uh, uh, Neil Ross, uh, you've had, You've interviewed Neil Ross. Yeah. That guy is so professional. That guy is so on the money. Um, uh, I tell people, if you want to be a voice actor, go to Neil Ross's website and listen to his demos. That's your competition. If you can't stand up against that, you aren't going to have a career. Um, I one time had a session where, um, uh, well, Neil came in and he did a, his first time he did a job for me. He was absolutely perfect and wonderful. And I just could not be, I've been happier with him. A couple of weeks later, uh, I've had him booked again. And another actor canceled on me at the last minute. I had an actor booked and he got a better offer. He, he got an offer to do a, a, a callback for a live, a, a national commercial, a voiceover for a, a live action commercial. And he thought there was more money there than what we paid on Garfield. And he decided to just flake on me. So I got Neil to come in and do Neil, I, Neil had, was leaving our session. I ran on, grabbed him in the parking lot. I said, come on back, do another cartoon. I, I need you to do another cartoon. And he was perfect in it. He took the part. And then a couple of weeks later, I had Neil booked and his agent called me and he said, um, Neil's booked for like one o'clock today. He woke up with a little bit of a scratchy throat. He's worried that he won't be able to give you his best performance. Um, could we have somebody else do it? He will show up if you want him but he's a little concerned he's not 100%. And I said to the agent, can you get me this other guy? And he said, yeah, you can get him. So I got the, I booked the other guy and Neil didn't come in that day. And I thought, what professional guy to, 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 to be so concerned about giving exactly what we're paying for. He was, and he, and he probably could have done it. I could have had Neil come in. I'm sure it would have been fine. But, but to turn down the day's pay but that professionalism made me want to hire Neil every time I could after that. Wow. Very, you know, Neil, Neil is one of those guys like Bob Bergen or Greg Berger who should teach classes in how to be a professional. Not, not how to do necessarily how to do the voices, which is obviously they could all teach very well, but to teach how to conduct yourself in a session, how to manage a career, what's ethical, what's not ethical, uh, uh, how you, you don't try to take a job away from somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you are patient a, a couple of times, you know, you get into a session and there's a technical problem or some reason why you have to say to a Neil Ross or a Greg Berger, guys, could you go sit in the waiting room for 40 minutes? I got to do something. I got to do something out of sequence here. I've got to get this other actor done. So we could, uh, when we were doing the Gar the Garfield, uh, the, the Garfield show, Wally Winger, who you should, you should interview, you'd love him. Um, I'm interviewing him um, this Saturday, actually. Good, great. Wally was for during this period. He was the announcer for the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. So every weekday, Monday through Friday, he had to be in Burbank at a certain time to record his announcements and things. And one day they called and they said, "We need you early for something. We've got a very elaborate thing. We need you to narrate for us. You've got to come in two hours early." And he came to me. So we had him booked in Garfield, and it, it would there would have been no problem getting him done with everybody else in sequence, in proper sequence, and getting him out to Burbank by his call time, but they moved it up two hours. And he came to me, says, are you can get me out of here by, you know, by 11 a.m. instead of, you know, one o'clock? And I said, sure. And everybody else in the session was fine with me 
putting them to one side, recording all of Wally's lines, and then going, and so he could leave and they could go back. Even though they ended up staying a little longer than they might have otherwise, they were fine with that because everybody else had done that for somebody else. They all made allowances for each other. Yeah, of course. I think that's a lovely way to close up this interview, I think. Yeah. Well, great. You know, I, Amber, I love your enthusiasm for voice people. I have the same enthusiasm. Uh, and if I were 17, I'd be expressing it as loudly as you do. Uh, I, 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 I slobbered all over, you know, Dawes, Butler, and June Perret when I <laughs> They were, they were nice to be other in spite of that oh but yeah it, it's uh yeah they're voice people are really lovely people which doesn't mean you know i've seen people at conventions take advantage of their hospitality it, it, you know stick tape recorders bases and recording say here we do say hello to my friends so we, we record this you know it, it's there's times when people push it too far and, and I, I feel bad about that we try to protect them when they're at san diego uh, doing our panels, and sometimes you can't always do that because some people are so aggressive. They want they want that personal contact. They want you to do a favor for them. But um, you know, you 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 showcase them here with your little interviews, and that's terrific. I love Thank that. You, Mark. I appreciate I'm, you. I, I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching every one of them I can. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this episode. Uh, make sure to go check out Mark. Mark, what's your website address? www.newsfromme.com, N-E-W-S-F-R-O-M-M-E.com, M-E are my initials. Sweet. Everything will be on there, including Mark's social media handles and just all his blog posts. They're just amazing. I sometimes spend hours reading them myself and they're just amazing. So thank, thank you. you. So, you're welcome. So, okay. so thank you so much for watching this episode and I will see you in another episode. Until then, though, bye. And... Cut.